And now we will continue with disagreement between West and East, talking about introducing the Orthodox Church. This is part three. Tensions began to mount as the first millennium was drawing to a close, while numerous doctrinal, political, and economic and cultural factors were working to separate the church in an East-West division to join divisive issues ultimately emerged above others. First, that one man, the Pope of Rome, considered himself the universal bishop of the church, and second, the addition of a noble clause to the church's creed. First, papacy. Among the twelve, St. Peter was early acknowledged as the leader. He was spokesman for the twelve before and after Pentecost. He was the first bishop of Antioch and later bishop of Rome. No one challenged his role. After the death of the apostles, as leadership in the church developed, the bishop of Rome came to be recognized as first in honor, even though all bishops were equal. But after nearly 300 years, the bishop of Rome slowly began to assume to himself a role of superiority over the others, uh, ultimately claiming to be the only true successor of Peter. The vast majority of the other bishops of the church never questioned Rome's primacy of honor, but they patently rejected the Roman bishops claim as the universal head of the church or not. This assumption of papal power became one major factor in rendering the Roman church and all those it could gather with from the historic Orthodox church. Second, addition to the creed, a disagreement concerning the Holy Spirit also began to develop in the church. Does the Holy Spirit proceed from one Father, or does He proceed from the Father and the Son? Our Lord Jesus Christ teaches, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of me. See John chapter 15, verse 26. This is the basic statement in all the New Testament about the Holy Spirit proceeding, and it is clear he proceeds from the Father. Thus, when the Asian Council at Constantinople in year 381 reaffirmed the Creed of Nicaea from the year 325, it expanded that Creed to proclaim this familiar, sorry, familiar words and in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver, giver of life who proceeds from the Father who is worshipped and glorified together with the Father and the Son but 200 years later at the local council in Toledo in Spain in the year 589 King Recaret declared the Holy Spirit also should be confessed by us and taught to proceed from the Father and the Son. The King may have meant well, but he was contradicting Christ's teaching confessed by the entire Church concerning the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, the local Spanish council agreed with this error, or with his error. Because of the teaching of the Holy Scriptures, believed by the Council of Nicaea and at Constantinople and for centuries beyond, there is no reason to believe anything other than that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. But centuries later, in what was at least partially a politically motivated move, the Pope from Unilate unilaterally changed the universal creed of the church without an ecumenical council. Though this change was initially rejected in both East and West, even by some of Rome's closest neighboring bishops, 
Pope managed to eventually get the West to capitulate. The consequence, of course, in the Western Church has been the tendency to relegate the Holy Spirit to a lesser place than God the Father and God the Son. The change may appear small, but the consequences have proven disastrously immense. This issue with the Pope departing from the Orthodox doctrine of the Church became another instrumental cause separating the Roman Church from the historic Orthodox Church, the New Testament Church. The Great Schism Conflict between the Roman Pope and the East mounted Especially in the Pope's dealing with the Bishop or Patriarch of Constantinople, the Pope even went so far as to claim the authority to decide who should be the Bishop of Constantinople and marked violation of historical pre precedent. No longer operating within the government of the New Testament Church, the Pope appeared to be seeking by political means to bring the whole Church under his domination. Bizarre intrigues followed one upon the other as a series of Roman popes pursued his or this unswavering goal of attempting to control all Christendom. Perhaps the most incredible incident of these political, religious and even military regimes occurred in the year uh, 1054. A cardinal sent by the Pope slapped the document on the altar of the Church of Holy Wisdom in Constantinople during the Sunday worship, excommunicating the Patriarch of Constantinople from the Church. The Pope, of course, had no legitimate right to do this, but the repercussions were staggering. Some dismal chapters of Church history were re written during the next decades. The ultimate consequence of Pope's action was that the whole Roman Catholic Church ended up dividing itself from the New Testament faith of Orthodox Christianity. The schism has never been healed. As the centuries passed, conflict continued. Attempt at union failed and the Roman Church drifted farther and farther from its historic roots. There are inevitable consequences in deviating from the Church. The breaking away of Rome from the historic Orthodox Church would prove an no exception. Further divisions in the West. During the centuries after the year 1054, the growing distinction between East and West was becoming indelibly marked in history. The East maintained the full stream of New Testament, faith, worship and practice, all the while enduring great persecution. The Western Roman Church, crippled because of its schism from the Orthodox Church, bogged down in many complex problems. Then, less than five centuries after Rome committed itself to its unilateral alteration of doctrine and practice. Another upheaval was festering, this time not next door to the East, but inside the Western gates themselves. Though many in the West had spoken out against Roman domination and practice in earlier years, now the little known German monk named Martin Luther inadvertently launched an attack, uh, an attack against certain Roman Catholic practices, which ended up affecting world history. His famous 95 theses were nailed to the church door at uh, Wittenberg in 1517. In a short time, those theses so we're signaling the start of what came to be called in the West the Protestant Reformation. Luther sought an audience with the Pope but was denied and in 1590, sorry, 1521 he was excommunicated from the Roman Church. He had intended no break with Rome. Its papal system of government, he heavy with authority, refused 
conciliation, the door to future unity in the West slammed shut with a resounding crash. The protests of Lut the protests of Luther were not unnoticed. The reforms he sought in Germany were soon accompanied by demands of uh, Ulrich Zwingli in Zurich. John Calvin in Geneva and hundreds of others all over Western Europe, fueled by complex political, social and economic factors, in addition to religious problems, the Reformation spread like a raging fire into virtually every nook and cranny of the Roman Church. The ecclesiastical monopoly to which it had Ali, every nook. Sorry, yeah, it, it had the polit the, ecclesi the sorry the ecclesiastical monopoly to which it had grown accustomed was greatly diminished, and massive division replaced its artificial unity. The ripple effect of uh, that division impacts even our own day as the protestant movement itself continues to split and shatter if trouble of the continent were not trouble enough the church of england was in the process of going its own way as well henry the eighth amidst his marital problems replaced the pope of rome with himself as head of the church of england for only a few short years would the pope ever again have ascendancy in England and the English church itself would soon experience great division as decade followed decade in the West. The many branches of uh, Protestantism took various forms. There were even divisions that insisted they were neither Protestant nor Roman Catholic. All seemed to share a mutual dislike for the Bishop of Rome and the practice of his church and most wanted far less centralized form of leadership while some such as the lutherans and anglicans held on to certain forms of liturgy and sacrament others such as the reformed churches and the even more radical anabaptists and their descendants questioned and rejected many biblical ideas of hierarchy hierarchy, sacrament, historic tradition, and other elements of Christian practice, no matter when and where they appeared in history, thinking they were freeing themselves from Catholicism. To this day, many sincere, more than professing Christians will reject even the biblical data which speaks of historic Christian practice simply because they think such historic practices are Roman Catholic. To use the old adage, sorry for mispronouncing, adage, they threw the baby out of the bath water without even being aware of it. Thus, while retaining in variety, uh, sorry, in varying degrees portion of foundational Christianity, neither Protestantism nor Catholicism can lay historic claim to being the true New Testament Church. In dividing from Orthodox Christianity, Rome forfeited its place in the Church of the New Testament in the divisions of the Reformation, the Protestants, all well-meaning as they might have been, failed to return to the New Testament Church.